Hi everyone. So far in the mechanical properties of material subseries, tensile testing, toughness concepts, hardness testing, bending tests, fatigue, and creep topics were covered. In the last video of this subseries, we will focus on failure mechanisms in materials. Ductile and brittle fractures were briefly covered in the preceding videos of this subseries. In addition to them, the crack propagation mechanisms and a few case studies will be covered in this video. So, let's unfurl the sails and start the last leg of this journey. The extent of plastic deformation a material goes through is the main measure used for categorization of that material as ductile or brittle. In brittle fracture, material shows little to no plastic deformation. As a result, absorbs tiny amounts of energy until fracture. On the contrary, ductile materials absorb high amounts of energy until fracture as they show noteworthy plastic deformation. Additionally, when we investigate fracture surfaces of ductile and brittle materials, unique macroscopic and microscopic distinctions are seen. A variety of fracture characteristics can be observed on fracture surfaces depending on the level of brittleness and ductility shown by the material. Materials with high ductility show a necking down to a single point during plastic deformation, which can be clearly seen at the fracture surface. And ductile materials in general show necking followed by formation of small cavities within. As deformation goes on, these cavities coalesce into cracks, and those cracks propagate, leading to the fracture. This type of fracture is called a cup and cone fracture, and shows fibrous features throughout the fracture surface, and the final fracture point shows a shear behavior. Under a scanning electron microscope, the fracture surface of a ductile material shows spherical features called dimples. They are indicators of the voids formed during plastic deformation. On the other side, for most brittle materials, cracks propagate through breaking the atomic bonds along a specific crystallographic plane. This process is called cleavage, and such a fracture is called a transgranular fracture, since the cracks propagate through the grains. In some other cases, after a material goes through some weakening or embrittling processes, cracks may propagate along the boundaries of the grains, rather than through them. Such a fracture is called an intergranular fracture. Since the crack initiation and propagation processes are quite different, none of the features seen at the fracture surface of ductile materials are seen over the fracture surface of the brittle materials. Unlike ductile materials, a flat fracture surface showing no sign of dimples or any other features such as the plastic deformation can be seen at the fracture surface of the brittle materials. However, features called chevron marks and fan-shaped ridges can be seen at the fracture surface of brittle materials. These features usually point at the origin of the crack, like beach mark and striation mechanisms covered for the fatigue deformation in video number 2.5. These features may even be visible to naked eye for some materials, enabling the rapid identification of the fracture characteristics of the specimen. Furthermore, some brittle materials have shiny and smooth fracture surfaces. Ah. So much theoretical stuff, right? No worries, Uncle TMG is here to pivot the video's flow to a more interesting direction. In the next part of the video, we will take a look at three real-life cases and try to understand the failure reasons of each case. Some materials show both ductile and brittle properties depending on the temperature. You may recall this phenomenon from video number 2.2, which is the ductile to brittle transition behavior. Ductile to brittle transition in a nutshell is a ductile material starting to show brittle characteristics and cooled below a material-specific temperature called ductile to brittle transition temperature. The discovery of ductile to brittle transition temperature coincided with World War II, 
As the Liberty ships started to experience structural damage due to the rapid crack growth over the deck of the ships, and a few of them catastrophically splitting in half as a result. Although the alloy used in the Liberty ships was ductile in room temperature, they were operating in the northern Atlantic Ocean region, where the water temperatures are quite lower than the room temperature. The lower temperatures have made the alloys to go through ductile to brittle transition, promoting the brittle characteristics, and leading to the catastrophic failure of some ships due to the brittle fracturing, rather than having plastic deformation. For our next case, we will be sailing from Northern Atlantic Ocean to Northern Pacific Ocean. An accident took place in a plane scheduled to fly from Hilo to Honolulu in Hawaii on April 28, 1988. In this event, the pilots landed the plane safely. However, due to the explosion occurred in the air, one flight attendant was fatally injured. Also, some passengers had some serious injuries. Investigations have shown that the accident was due to the fatigue cracking of the fuselage. However, proper inspection and maintenance of these parts could have prevented this accident, where the cold bond lap joints were discovered to have multiple defects from the early production stages, causing low bond durability and low corrosion resistance exacerbating a multiple site premature fatigue cracking, leading to the fuselage failure initiated in the lap joints. For our last case, we are flying from Northern Pacific Ocean to the American Northeast. Then, we will jump into a time machine and go a little bit more than a century back in time. In Boston, Massachusetts on January 15, 1919, a tank containing 2.3 million gallons of molasses had burst, causing the event called the Great Molasses Flood. This accident caused the death of 21 people and demolition of several buildings. The exact reason for failure is still unknown, but there are some theories. One thing mentioned was that the tank was filled to its maximum capacity with extra molasses just before the disaster. It is said that the existing molasses leaks before filling it up to full capacity were ignored. Furthermore, the steel sheet used in the production of the tank was said to have half of the thickness than it was supposed to have, making the tank not strong enough to hold molasses at full capacity. Also, the used steel was reported to have less manganese in it than it was supposed to, which promoted the brittle behavior in the alloy. In addition to these findings, further analysis revealed that the initial cracks were formed at the rivet holes due to flow rivets. The following two theories focus on the pressurization of the tank. First group says that the fermentation reactions were still going on inside the tank and it was believed to have produced enough carbon dioxide to pressurize the tank beyond its can stand. Others correlate the pressurization of the tank with the increased temperature, which might have occurred due to the newly transferred warmer molasses or simply the daily weather change. Higher temperatures could lead to the thermal expansion of steel, which can be one of the factors on top of the rest leading to the eventual catastrophic failure of the tank. For this case, fatigue cracks formed and failure occurred due to the material design faults, negligence of operating conditions, and neglecting all potential signals of the catastrophe during operation. With the third case covered, now we reach not only to the end of this video, but also to the end of the mechanical properties of materials subseries. The next video will be the first video of a new adventure, where we will be talking about phase equilibrium of materials. Specifically, in the next video, we will make an introduction to phase equilibria and cover some of the fundamental concepts, terminology, and unary phase diagrams. See you on the next one!